Anthropocene, a period marked by a regime change in the activity of industrial societies, which began at the turn of the 19th century and which has caused global disruptions in the Earth system on a scale unprecedented in human history. Climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution of the sea, land, and air, resources depredation, land cover denudation, radical transformation of the ecumene, among others. These changes command a major realignment of our consciousness and worldviews and call for different ways to inhabit the earth. This is a human's dining room. The restoration experiment where he left it alone for a period of months to see if it would restore itself to the way it was when he first bought the house. <laughs> or he hoped maybe it would renovate itself and become what he was envisioning. But months later, it's pretty much the same. So for the next phase of his experiment, he's going to build a bar, put up some walls, and clean a bit. Now this is my dining room. It's one of them. And this large table coral was such a valuable investment, you can see all the gorgeous colors of fish attracted to the living space. And my visitors, I have a lot. They just rave about how magical and functional it is. But then a bomb blasts, and someone dynamited for fish. Poseidon and I debate about this all the time. Do we just leave it alone and hope the coral reef rubble will rise from the dead? Or do we transform the destruction and rebuild life-supporting habitat? I say rebuild using biorock mineral accretion technology to address the effects of human predatory and parasitic symbiotic systems that flow throughout the ocean unchecked, what if people hone in on the specific needs of other species and develop mutually symbiotic relationships with other organisms besides their pets and houseplants? Do corals just need a surface to settle upon, like a shipwreck or maybe a million tires? No, it's not a superficial problem. And will marine protected areas be enough to ensure regeneration? They may keep out commercial fisheries and other visible invasions, which is great and important and necessary, yet many of the threats are invisible. Climate change, pollution, decreasing alkalinity and disease. Corals and their symbiotic beneficial algae partners, the zoosynthelae, have lived in harmony for thousands, maybe millions of years. The algae gives food and color to the polyp animal in exchange for protection. But with warming waters and compound stress, they've been breaking up and they both suffer the consequences. The corals starve, turn brittle and white, and the algae is probably eaten. It is sad. You can cry. There are some hopeful, promising studies showing that corals may be adapting to some of these increased temperatures, and I hope so. I hope they can evolve and adapt, and quickly. But right now, biorock restoration actively cultivates ecosystems. It stimulates vitality at the cellular and skeletal level. And what better way to do this than with electrolysis? This might be just what the polyps and the algae need, a three-way partnership that helps them adapt to the traumatic trends. So here's how it works. By running low-volt direct current through seawater, the limestone minerals abundant in the ocean deposit onto metal, and the resulting surface is a natural substrate for corals to settle on and colonize. It becomes a non-invasive mineral rock. The electricity locally raises the pH, creating an alkaline buffer zone. Now, this is important because with ocean acidification, and all the other factors, corals have a hard time getting the calcium carbonate they need to build their exoskeletons. So essentially, we're giving them free skeletons so they can use their energy for other vital activities, like reproduction. They can grow faster. They can survive higher temperatures that normally kill them. The electrolysis appears to increase their tolerance to some environmental stress. Biorock was invented by architect Professor Wolf Hilberts as a building material in the 70s. It has high compression strength, and it's self-repairing in the ocean. Then he teamed up with Dr. Tom Garreau of the Global Coral Reef Alliance to develop coral restoration, sustainable fishing, and permeable breakwaters. And it can be applied to oysters, mussels, and seagrasses. I want you to imagine coral polyps and vertebrate animals calcifying onto this aquatic topiary. So here's six years coral growth in an area previously devastated by dynamite and cyanide fishing. The minerals keep building up because the limestone is porous, and if you get really close, if you're there, you can see the hydrogen bubbles fizzing up from the surface. So as long as the electricity is flowing, the chemistry is going. There's about 60 coral arcs in Pamutron Bay in Bali, home of the largest biorock nursery in the world. And all the native species are represented. The community is very much behind the project because it helps their ecotourism, supplies their fish stocks, and they love natural beauty. 
I got to help weld, install, and plant this structure back in 2004 at a workshop. And I just got this footage last week from Thomas Sarkisian. He's the electrical engineer I'm working with on a project. So I'm really very happy to be able to share that with you because that place looked really bad. Um, now, for you do-it-yourselfers, I want you to see the basic steps. Design, weld, immerse, electrify. I'm hoping for a self-contained power supply. Source homeless fragments, attach with wires and pliers, and watch it grow. Now, <laughs> they're so sweet. Thank you. OK. Now, this is another sculpture in Bali. It's a little janky. It's called zigzag. It's very zigzaggy, but I wanted to show you progression. This is three months, two years, three and a half years. And after six years, Liku Liku's overgrown. The sculptures can be any shape or size, from the small coral skirt to reefs miles long. Maybe some tango dancers. If we can build a super highway, we can build a super reef. We already have artificial reefs thriving with 20 to 50% more biomass than most natural reefs. I'm talking about decommissioned oil wells. And rather than scrap them as most regulations require, we could apply wave or tidal energy to prevent corrosion and to provide an alkaline boost to counterbalance ocean acidification caused by carbon absorption. It's a great karmic twist. Now, my current living sea sculpture is inspired by DNA. And I owe great thanks to all my Kickstarter backers, Carnish Foundation, Birth of Philanthropies, TED Fellowship, and the team that helped me to make it this far. We plan to install it in the underwater museum in the National Marine Park of Cancun to distract and lure the tourists away from the over-snorkel natural reefs and so it can become a coral refuge and biodiversity study. Science and policy are key to coral health. And I invite you to add the arts into the equation. Coral reefs are one of our planet's oldest natural communities. Established reefs are five to 10,000 years old. And according to scientist David Miller, humans share similar innate immunity genes, so you're deeply connected. And if they're in trouble, you're in trouble. I've been talking a lot about how we can help them, because they truly are our life support. I imagine swimming around this table with all sorts of species, thankful we were able to stimulate mutual symbiosis in the Anthropocene.